we're gonna be cooking here. Look at my hair. All right. What we're gonna have is some squash and some eggs. And uh, I'm not gonna do the omelet rice, which is a staple in my kitchen, because I'm gonna be eating a bunch of peanuts too. So what we're gonna have is this piece of squash. I've been chopping them this way, which is good. It's fun to eat them like that, but the problem is when you get them that way, you've got like 16 little round pieces to flip in the pan. So we're gonna get this going here. This leg's too tall. Oh, look at that. Let's see what we can do here. You can see the pan already. It's all coming into focus. We're getting there. Oh boy. We're old fashioned in this kitchen. You gotta light it with a match. We got propane, but we don't got electricity on this stove. Whoops. And before you put it in the trash, you gotta make sure it's not hot anymore you catch your trash on fire. A little bit of olive oil. And the way we're going to do these this time, to avoid having to flip a bunch of little pieces, is we're going to do long strips. <laughs> Did I ever tell you guys? I have uh, some adventures with these tripods. All right. Well, it ain't 16 and it ain't four, but at least it ain't 16. Look at those knife skills, man. Did this guy train at the Sorbonne Gavion or what? Then while we got this in the pan, We're gonna have one with egg, with tomato, and one with jalapeno. It's gonna be delightful. Half a tomato is enough. We're just gonna do uh, two sets of two eggs. Let's see, this is my uh, vegetable container. Lala. That's a nickname. A true love of mine had for her friend Laura. Okay. I'm gonna get these small. These knife skills, man. I think you've got Wolfgang Puck in here or something. The Emerald Lagasse, that was my favorite. Actually, my favorite growing up was Drew Stone Will Song. Who I'm pretty damn sure was born in the same state as me. We'll we use a little bit of salt. Put some in here, two eggs coming up. And we got just a little eggshell in here. We're gonna fix that right away. I 
about some garlic powder. Y'all like garlic powder, it's really good. Now this thing that I'm so happy about is when it comes time for flipping. Look at that. It's gonna be much easier. I don't know that it's quite time for flipping on all of these. But we're already halfway there or more. So that ought to be pretty good. While we sit down to chat, we're gonna eat this stuff and have my favorite snack in the world, peanuts with a shell on, which of course I don't eat them that way, but the shell slow me down. I got this from my favorite peanut vendor here in Pueblo Dev. I mean, look at the size of these things, if I can get past the bag. These are, uh, Good peanuts. We'll be enjoying some of those. All right, we're jamming. What else did I need? Jalapeno. Well, screw it, we're gonna use the whole thing. I'll put just a few pieces in this. And then the other one will be straight jalapeno. straight jalapeno one. Remind me not to touch my eyes or other sensitive areas of my body. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about out there if you've ever done that. If you're touching the pepper, don't touch the pepper. Okay, that all work pretty good. Now we're certainly ready for, these are definitely done. Look at that, beautiful, beautiful stuff, guys. Whoa, don't get oil on this. This is a, did I tell you guys I'm a professional? Definitely you should not try this stuff at home. Okay. We have a plate, it needs to be dry. This one in. Heat down just a bit for this. And I like to put this lid on when I make the eggs. It makes them really fluffy. And then we're gonna start this next. <laughs> the tomato seed. Okay. Two more wings. sit down in just a moment I'll be able to see who's here say hi to you guys I love garlic powder I love fresh garlic I just don't have any And 
I'm not gonna try levels. No, I shouldn't. This arm looks too big. <laughs> it was a bite of Bravo. I was trying to pan flip thing. I think that's just asking for trouble here. But look at this. How heavenly, how heavenly, not my face, is this. Who we got in here? How you doing, Leisure? Vintage life. Hey, buddy. Yeah, fresh garlic would be great. Uh, but I just got the powder. And... Yeah, see, it's not very uh, <laughs> good and tempera and fried. So, uh, omelet parmesan. Oh, you were talking about the squash, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, we do actually have a professional chef in here, my friend Dan. Now, uh, the way I do what I call an omelet is not, this is not like a French omelet. <laughs> so uh, this is more like what they would call an omelet in Asia or in uh, or India or somewhere like that, I guess. Um, it's just a, well, you see what it is. It's just a flat, like a flat thing. So it's just a patty that I'm gonna flip here in a moment. I'm not gonna do the hand uh, <laughs> I destroyed a couple omelets trying to do tricks for you guys last time I tried that. Yeah, it's... I think frittatas, don't they put those in the oven for a while too? This is just... Uh, I don't know what to really call it. They call this, They just call it omelet in Asia and that's kind of what I call it. But I love to put this just on top of... You cook some rice and throw this on top of it. In Thailand, they would make this with either with minced pork uh, or just plain. And they put a lot of oil, so they uh, when they make these, they're almost like fried. They're very puffy. I don't put that much oil, but I do get a little bit of that effect by using the lid. It gets the, uh, it really rises in there. Um, this is probably ready for flipping. Here we go, guys. So this is a little, this is actually pretty good. It's a little bit maybe on the brown side. So uh, I barely, it's pretty much cooked. I'm just cooking it a tiny bit on this second side and then it's done. Um, and then the second one, actually this one had the tomato. The tomato makes it take longer to cook. Sometimes I'll even put salsa in there. Uh, so that's it. But this is not gonna balance. <laughs> this will work. So that's it. Woo. Now we do the whole process again. And I'm gonna go ahead and sit down with you guys after I get this one in the pan. And now I'm gonna show you my whacker. Not the one you're thinking about, ladies, but the other whacker. The whacker I just bought today at the store. Not really at the store, I'll tell you the whole story. You'll enjoy this. So now we're just gonna put the heat on low, let that thing take its time, and we're gonna have us a chef. We're gonna talk about my whacker. <laughs> It's not really a whacker. People are gonna start making fun of me if I keep calling it a whacker. Uh, uh, <laughs> because I'm not gonna whack anybody. Uh, this is really mainly just in case I run into any uh, crazy dog again. Um, as most of you know, I was recently bitten by a dog here in Puebla. Snuck up behind me and just bit me out of nowhere. Um, so 
And I don't know if this is uh, going to really dissuade any dogs or not. I kind of think, in general, street dogs may have had some experience with being whacked. My theory is that street dogs would be messing around stores early in the morning when everybody's out mopping or sweeping or cleaning in front of their store, which they do religiously here, very frequently, daily. Um, <laughs> so I've been telling you guys, I think if I just have this in my hand, that the dogs will be less prone to mess with me. Um, so this is a broomstick that I found. I was talking to you guys about needing some kind of stick and I always see people here carry sticks when they're out walking their dogs, basically to whack dogs that mess with their dog. Um, it's very short, that's what she said. Um, <laughs> and that is what she said because Leisure's a woman. So right after I made that stream with you guys about where am I gonna find a stick? Because the only ones I've seen in stores like Canes and stuff, they want way too much money. And lo and behold, the next morning I went out and I showed you guys that broomstick I found in the trash that was broken. So I took the broken broomstick to the store, to the carpenter, I mean, and told him, can you cut it here and here? And he did. And he charged me 10 pesos to cut it, <laughs> which is 50 cents US. And then I went looking for some pieces of metal to put on there and I found these at the little local mom and pop hardware store for 10 pesos each. So now I've got 20 pesos into it. And then I took it back to the carpenter and I said, I need you to securely fasten these on the end. I asked him, puedes, <laughs> I don't need to tell you all the, uh, adjuntar, uh, Puedes, an, adjunta, puedes adjuntar, uh, how do you say, de la segura, or a la segura means securely. Can you securely attach these? Um, and he told me, I was talking to him about it, and I said, posible con pegamento, which is glue. And he said, si, sí, but... He was explaining that he couldn't do it because it was painted. This was painted blue. So then he said he could fix it up for me. He said, come back tomorrow. And I said, uh, I said, um, how much? So it was another 30 pesos. So I got, what is that? 60 pesos in this thing, which is $3 US. But if you ask me, this is a pretty damn fine non-walking stick. And it just looks weird. Like I was showing this to my friend today, he was with me when I picked it up at the store and I said, what do you think people would think this is? And he says, I don't know, I think they might think it's for like testing electrical voltage or something so you don't shock yourself. It just looks too weird to, for people to think it's any kind of weapon, I think. And it's not a weapon, it's just, you know, it's kind of fun walking around with this thing it's very small, so I can like, you know, if I don't want people to really see I'm carrying it, I can just carry it like this, it's lightweight. I don't want to carry anything around that's really long enough for a walking stick because it's, uh, you know, heavy and big. And I also told you guys I had a, not really an altercation, but kind of a strange experience with this, these juvenile delinquents who are on drugs and, uh, I thought they might try to follow me up the stairs. It was by an overpass. And you know, if, if they would have followed me, I was thinking I'd just try to shove them down the steps. But uh, the problem with trying to do something like that is they can grab your arm or your leg. But <laughs> if you needed to uh, move an object and you didn't want this to be grabbed by the object, all you gotta do is push it and let go. So uh, it has a lot of purposes. I'm not saying I'm gonna use this for anything nefarious, but I am citing a couple of experiences I had where this might've come in handy if things had gone another way. That's all I'm saying. And yeah, it could be a baton. I could learn to twirl it or I could learn to 
do all kinds of things. So anyway, that's what I got. And uh, had a heck of a day, guys. I walked for probably, uh, I was trying to walk to get an airline ticket for my visa reset that I was telling you guys about that's coming up. And uh, man, I walked an hour down to the central part of town for that and then caught the bus back. And uh, if I experience juvenile delinquents, the most likely outcome is I'm just gonna run away. And I don't have anything that's worth stealing. So uh, it's really not a problem. I'm just saying if they tried to, if they tried to pursue me, because basically I just told them, lo siento, no entiendo, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying, and then just quickly went up the steps, and they didn't follow me. But the guy did physically contact me, so... You know, that's why I thought they, they, thought they may pursue. But I was ready to run. Plus, I had a frying pan I just bought. I think I might have to flip this other egg. These are really good, guys. Highly recommend eggs for a good source of protein. It's actually the best source of protein. Oh my, look at this. It's all bubbly. You all see that? <laughs> Now the heat goes off. This is going to be good. And the heat goes off. That reminds me of, whoops. <laughs> I was gonna to try to do a trick for you guys. Decided to try to flip, but it didn't work out. That's okay. No harm, no foul. Not really. Not sure about this apartment, guys. Having some serious moisture issues. It's kind of like a dungeon or a cave because it's down here in the kind of basement garage. And uh, yeah, you probably wouldn't like these if you don't like them cooked too hard. You would probably call this too hard. I like it though. I also like when I don't add anything to the eggs, I like cooking just a plain egg and just uh, possibly not even flipping it, but sometimes maybe flipping it just for a second. Basically just when the white starts to solidify, just put it on top of the rice. That's really good. Or on top of whatever, beans, some meat, whatever you're into. So like I said, the reason I didn't, uh, the reason I'm not having rice with my dinner is because I just bought a kilo of peanuts from my favorite peanut vendor from Mercado. If you ever uh, are in Puebla and you go inside Mercado Zapata, that's where they're at. It's this guy who's probably like in his mid forties, him and his mom. And she's gotta be like, I don't know, it could even be his grandma for all I know. She's at least, He's probably more like 50 something and she's probably more like 80 something. And 
if you're in Mercado Zapata. I can highly recommend, I just tried some of this. Uh, there's a store called El Capullo, which is a coffee store. And uh, I got this dark coffee. This was uh, 100 pesos for a half kilo, which uh, is really not a bad price. This is kind of a middle of the road type coffee I got from the grocery store here. And this was 454 grams for 100 pesos or 99 pesos. This was 95 for 500 grams. It was actually like 505, I saw her weigh it. Um, and they roast it themselves in-house. They have this coffee roaster. I'd never seen a coffee roaster before. That was pretty cool, man. Um, they do it all there. And they asked me what kind of grind I wanted, like how I was gonna prepare it, all that stuff. And I actually tried it. I had a little espresso. This is, that was the same coffee. The espresso was 15 pesos, which is 75 cents. That was really good. Um, and these peanuts are, these are a little, you can get them cheaper. These are 50 pesos for a kilo, but they're the best peanuts I have found in Puebla. These are so good. Every one of them is really big. I'm gonna show you guys some peanut hacks. So keep watching this video and you're gonna see I got some tips. I've eaten so many peanuts. I've got tips for eating peanuts, believe it or not. Um, but some of the hacks I use are less necessary for these peanuts because they're so good. So stay tuned for that after I finish my eggs. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions or topic suggestions, please post them. So for the same price that I got that kind of, it's like starting to get to the good quality without being super expensive. Like if you get the really fancy stuff from the grocery store, that's kind of the range that that coffee is that I showed you that I got from the grocery store. And this is a little cheaper because I got more for a few pesos less and it's really good. Now there's some super gourmet stuff that my friend took me to try down the road, but that's a little beyond my, uh, I mean, I enjoy it. I may not enjoy it as much as like a true aficionado that tries all kinds of fancy coffees, but I do enjoy it. But for me, it's a little, uh, you know, I don't need to be spending as much money on coffee as that stuff is. It's pretty pricey, man. Even just a cup of coffee is like, 250 US or two bucks US. So that's a little a little steep for Bo Burson. No, not 500 pesos for coffee. This coffee cost 95 pesos. So this was less than $5 US for half a kilo, which is over a pound. I think that's a good price, I don't know. It's from right here in Mexico, they grow it in Chiapas. Um, no, nothing I was talking about cost 500 pesos. I think that might have been a typo. The peanuts are 50 pesos a kilo, the coffee is 95 pesos for a half kilo. And you don't get it, like I've told you guys about with Mexico, you don't get price breaks for buying more. <laughs> That's not a thing here. <coughs> when you buy things in bulk like that, it's the same price no matter how much you get. If I would've got a quarter kilo, I guess you get a tiny price break going from a quarter kilo because a quarter kilo was 50, half kilo was 95, full kilo was 190. So the Kilo and half kilo are the same, quarter kilo, you pay a tiny bit more, but it's never anything substantial. And they give you big samples of things. I was with my friend who was buying some almonds and walnuts, and they were giving us samples of all the different nuts they had. 
And then we went to the cheese counter. He needed to buy some cheese and they have this quesillo here, which is this Oaxacan cheese that is just, oof, next level stuff, guys. It's basically like mozzarella, but it's super big strands. It's like, uh, it's something, man. If you've seen how cheese is made homemade, some of my, uh, my mom makes it and it's these long strings and the way they do it, it's these huge, huge pieces. And she handed me this piece of cheese to try that was like this long and this big around. It was a chunk. I bit this piece off the end. I was like, yeah, this is good. I don't know what I'm gonna do with the rest. <laughs> I put it in my bag with my peanuts and gave it to a dog on the way home. That dog was on cloud nine, boy. He had like a, <laughs> it took him a little minute to eat that cheese. It was a lot of cheese and it was a small dog. <laughs> He was very happy. We're getting there, boys and girls. There's a lot of eggs. Was there a question in here somewhere? What happened to my bike? Hey, Dale, how you doing? Trout Junkie's in here, too. How you doing, Trout Junkie? Um... That's a good question. Farms outside the city. Uh, leisure, see you later. Um, yeah. Sold it. Those peanuts, they sell like that. You know, what, no matter how they're doing them, whether it's roasted ch chestnuts, uh, I've seen all kinds of different nut preparations in my travels. I think my very favorite personally was in Malaysia. Uh, my very favorite peanut dish also was in Malaysia. I'll talk about both those in just a minute. Okay, I think we got them all. So farms outside the city, I don't know, man. I think the farms, it would be too hard for me to get to, honestly, because Puebla, if you look at Puebla on a map or experienced Puebla in person. It's the second largest city in Mexico. Six million people, I think. The sprawl is just, you know, the sprawl that I've experienced personally in cities like, big cities in Texas like Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, those are nothing compared to this. This is enormous. And this city is just, if you look at a map, it's just, you know, <laughs> well, you can just think about the sheer numbers of it. I don't know what the population of greater metropolitan area is for Houston, for example, but it can't be more than a couple or a few million, right? I don't know. Is Houston more than that? Is Houston anywhere approaching six million? I don't think so. And Houston is enormous. So... For me to get outside the city to where a farm would be, I don't know, man. Going between here and Mexico City on the bus, which was, I believe, 60-ish kilometers, if I'm not mistaken, 50 or 60 kilometers, there was nothing farm-like that I recall between here and Mex between here and Mexico City, not really. There was maybe a little bit but between Mexico City and Valle de Bravo, going in that direction, I saw a lot more of that. So maybe that's more of a possibility between there. I think those two cities are like 30-ish kilometers apart. Now my, my bike, uh, my bike is still in Mexico City. So there are bike lanes. Here in Puebla, there's actually a really nice bike lane that goes uh, to Centro, kind of the downtown area. Then there's also a really nice, really nice bike lane that goes down the center of this big highway called Periferico. And uh, it goes like four, 12 or 14 kilometers, which really isn't that far, guys. Um, I mean, for, 
for an exclusive beautiful bike lane yeah it's a lot more than most cities offer but for me i'll walk somewhere that's two hours away that's not a big deal for me um I'll usually only walk one day, one way and take the bus the other way, but walking two hours to somewhere is nothing. And that's, uh, see, I gotta go back and forth between kilometers and miles. That would be six miles, so maybe nine kilometers or more like 10 kilometers. So it's really not a big deal for me to walk that somewhere just that far pretty much. Um, and the reason I didn't take my bike here, there's a few reasons. One of the main reasons is, I think it's just dangerous as shit. And all that happened in Mexico City was I got so frustrated. Every time I went to ride the bike, I told you guys, I would end up in yelling at cab drivers who were endangering me. And, uh, it would just kill, any fun I had on the bike was killed by the traffic altercations I would find myself in if I wanted to, felt inclined to defend myself at all, verbally. Um, which, I'm an American. <laughs> I mean, they do the same thing in other countries. I'm not saying it's exclusive to Americans, but we let people know when we don't like them endangering us in traffic. And on the bike, it was a constant thing. It still happens on foot, just not that often. So that's another reason. It just wasn't like groovy vibes riding the bike because of that. And there's probably more bike lanes and it's probably a little safer in Puebla, but not to the extent that it's worth the expense, effort, and hassle of bringing that bike here, which would be I'd have to have something to put it inside. I'd have to get like a really big cardboard box or some kind of bag. I guess I could use a tarp and bungee cords maybe, but I'd have to put it inside something. You can't just take a bike frame on the bus. You know, you got the big bays that open up to put stuff underneath. But if you put just a bike frame in there, it's gonna damage people's luggage. So it's gotta be inside something. And, <laughs> I gotta get it to the bus station. So, I guess if it was on a Sunday, I could have taken the whole bike on it. The, they let you take bikes on the subway on Sundays in Mexico City. And uh, I could get it through the subway to the bus station in one piece and then take the wheels off, put it inside boxes or bags, put it on the bus, but then I would have to um, either take a taxi or carry the damn thing. I can't carry it, it's too much. I guess I'd have to put it back together on the other end and just ride it. <laughs> if I got a bus to this part, I guess it would probably, I don't know. The cheapest I could get that done for would be 200, I could take the cheap bus to go to Mexico City, the expensive bus back to get me to this side of town. 350 plus something to put in, 500, it wouldn't be that bad. Maybe 500-ish if I went through the most pain in the ass to me personally to be able to do it. But to make it easier on myself, it gets more expensive. If you start involving taxis and all this stuff, it gets, you know, it can get quite expensive and then it just quickly becomes not worth it because I can get a bike here for pretty cheap. I'm just kind of over the whole bike idea in all honesty. As much as I love bikes, and I love bikes, but I also love being able to walk, you know? And I just see too damn many wrecks. My friend Omar kept getting in wrecks. 
kept getting hit by cars in Mexico City. I told you guys about that. Now here in Puebla, my friend here in this building who I was just at the store with, he had a bike accident and his whole head, he has a shaved head and his whole head was, he had this huge gash that they had to sew, stitch up. And he hasn't been able to run, he's a runner. He hasn't been able to run because his ribs were cracked and he just had a hell of a time after that wreck. Um, so I don't know, man. I just kind of feel like if you keep seeing that stuff again and again with people you know, it's maybe a little bit of a signal to Yeah, man, that's great. I love bikes for years. If you guys look back through my videos, you'll see those times. But for years, I uh, used use the bike to get to work. That was my means of transportation. And while I lived in Houston, whew, I lived in Houston and I was a fearless young whippersnapper. <laughs> I have some crazy bike stories about Houston. You know, everything from almost getting in fights with these crazy drivers to flipping over somebody's hood who pulled out in front of me, literally flipping. I did a full flip and land on my feet and my bike got scratched and I was pissed. And then some pedestrian told me that she was laughing at me. So I tried to chase the motorist. Uh, but the craziest story in Houston was when I, uh, I took a spill and cut my, cut my face or my head. I don't remember exactly, but I remember blood was dripping past down my face. So I guess it was my forehead probably. Uh, took a spill and spilled fortunately onto the sidewalk when I spilled and not into the street. And I was on my way to work and I was working at a photo lab so that you wear like a white smock, like a white big, shirt and uh i didn't want to get blood on it so i was going in the store to you know get some paper towels and take care of the cut on my head a little bit and while i was in the store i didn't have a lock with me because i just put my bike in the storeroom i was working at eckerd's in the photo lab and uh you know my bike got stolen <laughs> when i was in the damn restroom cleaning up my wound from the bike accident and the chain wasn't on the bike that's what somebody just walked off with it because something had happened with the chain i didn't even really have time to look at what happened but the chain was off and that was part of the reason i took the spill that was a nice bike too i think it was a fuji old, old 10 speed that my parents gave me from, my dad used to ride it to work. So I feel you, you're probably more into bikes than I am, but you know, if you're in a place where it's dangerous, you gotta be smart. And it sounds like you're in a place where you're able to do it safely, which is awesome. Uh, answer the farm's question. Oh yeah, I was gonna talk about my favorite peanut dishes in Malaysia for Soul Deep, I think it was. Uh, so the peanut thing that I saw that they had for snacks that I really liked, they had this, uh, I think they just cooked the peanuts in oil with a bunch of uh, peppers. And they really, really, I don't know if the peppers, I guess the peppers are probably dried before they do this. I don't know. They could just cook the hell out of them during the process, but you basically end up with these kind of dry little tiny bits of pepper and uh, and with your peanuts and they sell them in little bags. I used to get those. Man, those were good. But my favorite peanut dish of all that was more like a dish was this stuff that they made. I showed it to you guys back in the Malaysia videos, but... Uh, it's 
uh, peanuts with anchovies. How you doing, Ethan? So they took these like dried anchovies and fry them up in some oil with peanuts. Oh my God. That was my favorite, man. I know you guys saw me eat that in the Malaysia videos. I would, usually what I would get, I would get one of those fish where they basically, after they gut the fish, they fill the inside, where the insides were, they fill up with pepper paste and then grill the whole fish. I would have one of those with a pile of rice and on top of the rice, I would just put a bunch of those anchovies with peanuts and I'd have some of the veggies on the side. Man, I miss that buffet in Malaysia. I love Malaysian food. I can't wait till they open up for travel again, man. Yeah, I love that place, man. I can't even, they charge you by how much stuff you get. And I think it would usually cost, gosh, I don't even think it was 10 ringgit. I know sometimes they'd only charge me six or seven. But if I got a drink and I really piled up the food, I could maybe, maybe get to nine or 10, I guess. And it's four ringgit per dollar. So, you know, I could get a whole fish, just a whole fish and rice with a little bit of veggies and it would only be like a dollar or something. U.S. Yeah, I love that restaurant with the chickens. They had the chickens running around and they had the koi ponds. Yeah, the fish is great in Malaysia. You know, at that place, it wasn't the best. In all honesty, it was really good. But anywhere you go like that, where it's a super cheap buffet, the fish tends to be a little drier. I mean, that's just the way it is. If you wanna spend the bucks and get a fresh fish prepared just for you, it's a little more expensive. But the best fish I ever had was, uh, had to be in Malaysia, man. They had really good, obviously really good fish in Thailand too. But the best place I ever went, it's a little bit of a toss up. It's really prepared two different ways. They're both prepared in foil pouches, but there was a, uh, what was it? Uh, Istanbul, what do you call that? Uh, well, I think the people were from Istanbul and I don't remember what they called that style of fish, but uh, Oh man, it was good. There's a video about that because it was so expensive. <laughs> I had to go and get more money and bring and come back. It was so friggin' expensive. I can't believe I was, I grossly miscalculated how much that was gonna cost. They tell you how much it is by the kilo, but it's hard to really understand, especially if you're not that familiar with kilos or with buying fish in that manner, and I'm not. I don't know anything, you know, if you had it a lot of times, maybe you know what to expect, but I think it was <laughs> like a hundred ringgit, which is 25 bucks. But, uh, oh my God, that fish was so good. And then right across the street from there, there was another place where this Thai lady, she, uh, she made me this very spicy fish. Oh my God. She put it in the same thing, like in a foil pouch with lemons and a bunch of peppers. And man, that was, uh, you just sit there and pick the meat off the bone and eat it, you know, from the whole fish. And it was so good. And that was pretty pricey too. That one was, wasn't 25 bucks, but it was probably 12 to $15 US. Now for, in Thailand, it's just about as good. You can go to the night market in Thailand and get a huge fish. 
either uh, cooked in the manner I was just describing, or you can get it that's just grilled right on the grill, which is more like the Malaysian, the traditional Malaysian way I was telling you at the first. Or you can get the ones where they just coat it in a whole ton of salt. Do you know what I mean? Where they just like, I can't remember what they wrap it in, if it was like wrapped in a banana leaf or if they do it with foil or what, but I think there's something they put inside, but it's just inside a bunch of real coarse salt. And that's good too. But uh, the whole fish from the night market in Thailand, I remember it being only like 80 to 100 baht, depending on the size of the fish. And that's only 30 baht to a dollar, like, uh, you know, 250 to $3 US, $2.50 to $3 for a whole fish. That's pretty much as good as that real fancy fish I was just telling you about. And they're, they're cooking them fresh all night. So you're getting it fresh off the grill and it's not dried out from sitting there, you know, on a steam bath. But, uh, well, I don't even think they use steam baths at the Malaysian buffet. I think they were just, you know, they just sit there. The food's not hot once it's, it's hot when they first cook it, but that's it. It was the same way at the Indian buffet in Malaysia that I showed you guys. It's hard to complain when it's like a dollar fifty or two dollar buffet. I mean, God, you can get enough food for the whole day going there. Um, Eggs down. You know what time it is, guys. I actually thought of doing a video series where uh, <laughs> I think I told you guys this joke before. I thought about doing a, uh, a video series called Talking Caca Wates. You know, Caca Wates is peanut in Spanish and talking caca, like talking shit. But I was thinking I could just, you know, have a little saltier type video where I tell dirty jokes and, you know, say what I really think of things. Maybe I'll still do that someday. I got enough peanuts. Embarrassingly, these might not last me very long, but I mean, these things, they're all like really big. See, the problem sometimes when you're eating a bunch of peanuts and you're buying them in bulk is you'll get some, like this one's a little deformed. This could have some issues. It's probably okay. We'll open this one up first. Yeah, this one's fine. Sometimes you'll get them that the peanut, this is a little dusty, but sometimes you'll get them where they have like that dark, funky looking dust. Those are usually bad. Of course, sometimes you'll also get these peanuts that are like, uh, see, I don't know if I'm gonna find any in here because these are really high quality, but sometimes you'll get these peanuts where it's like round on one side and then it shrinks down real small and it gets black on the end. Those are very often are bad. And of course, if you open the shell and the peanuts are really tiny, that's a gamble. Because <laughs> sometimes they're good, but sometimes they're really bitter. So what I would normally do if I'm eating peanuts and I don't get the really good peanuts, what I do is I take about three peanuts worth which is six nuts, usually. Usually you'll get two inside. The most I ever got is four. Now, if you've gotten more than four, I want you to let me know in the comments, and if you have a picture of that, I wanna see it. Because the most I've ever seen in my life is four inside one nut. But maybe someday, some great day, you'll see a video if it happens. I might be 80 years old, 
But if I ever open a peanut in C5, I'm going to have a shit. That's going to be the most amazing day of my life. So what I'll do is I save about six of these, maybe eight. I put them off to the side here. And the reason I do that is because there's nothing worse than if you're getting down to the end of a dish of something and you get a bad bite and then you're stuck with having, that's the last bite. And then that's, that's what you're left with is this nasty bite. And if it's peanuts, it's like eating the last peanut of a whole bag of peanuts and then it's a really bad peanut and it's bitter and it's moldy and it's nasty and you gotta spit it out. You know those nuts when you get them that are just, you don't even wanna eat it, you just gotta spit it. And then you, you gotta spit like four or five times to get all of it out of your mouth and then you still have the flavor. If you have six or eight really good ones, you save the really plump, nice ones that are not discolored Keep some of those aside for the very end, just in case you end on a bad nut, because you're never gonna end on a bad nut if you got some good nuts reserved. So that's a tip I learned once from a squirrel. I recommend saving a few good nuts, and then you're never gonna go wrong. Just put them aside there. Now, of course, I'm not gonna get to the bottom of this bag, but, <laughs> um, you know what the thing is. Here's one with four. No, it only had three. I'm surprised. This was a big one. But see, it's really rare to get four. Anyway, that's my little peanut hack. And you probably don't need it if you have a big bag or if you have some really high quality ones, but it can come in handy. It saved me quite a few times. There, I got me a little reserve now. So no matter what happens, you always got a good bite to end on. You guys got any topics or questions for me here? Yeah, there was another, there was a bunch of restaurants. I mean, there was a, I know I made a video at the one where I went for Tom Yum. That's a, man, that's another good dish. When you get, we're talking about the quality of the fish in Asia, I was, thinking about uh, the squid in Malaysia. Not something I would usually probably be a fan of, but I like those little things, those little purple ones. They're just like little babies. I mean, they're not even this big. They're just, you know, like, uh, well, not much bigger than this peanut. Look at that. What the heck do we have going on here? Not much bigger than this peanut would be the whole squid. Actually, they're probably more like, uh, probably more like this. Like a couple peanuts, little babies. You'll see them out there fishing for them at night. They put these green lights on the water. But uh, yeah, there was a place I went. The place I went the most times was the, the burger place. And they also had noodles that were really good. They had like, kind of chow mein style noodles or, uh, you know, like the, it's like spaghetti, but maybe a little bit fatter and shorter, shorter strands. But they would make that with chicken or with, uh, probably with, uh, oh, with shrimp, where I would eat the whole shrimp. You remember because in the US, I'd always had shrimp without the legs. And the, uh, I do think they removed the heads. Maybe you guys can help me remember. But I was used to eating shrimp without the tail or without the legs in the US. And they serve them to you with everything in Malaysia. And the way I would see people eat it is just you eat the whole thing. And I did that and it was crunchy. That was another thing they served with the noodles, but they also had the burgers at that place. Then there was the place I went that had the really fancy burger. I'm pretty sure I took you guys there. That was a little, that was kind of a one-off. I didn't really go to that place much. It was a really good burger, but it was expensive, man. And the cheap burger place I went to was only like, I don't even remember. It's in the video. I think it was like, I would usually get two burgers and it would be, I don't know, eight or 10 ringgit. Probably, I don't even remember. 
So uh, then there was a place I went. I don't know if I took you guys to this place, but the place where the lady who cooked my food was holding a naked baby right before she made my food and she didn't wash her hands. I know I, know I told you that story. Um, that was another noodle place. They call the noodles uh, campoom or uh, something campoom, which means like camp or campground or something. I don't remember. Gorang, Gorang. I think G-O-R-E-N-G -G is noodles maybe. Goreng Kampung or something, I don't know. Or Goreng means grilled, I don't know, whatever, man. But then, uh, yeah, the other places I usually took you guys were the, the Indian buffet, which I didn't find until I was leaving one time. And also to that buffet that was right down the hill. That's where I went more often than anything, the place with the fish. And I think about that. Of all the places I've traveled, I think of Malaysia the most. It was my favorite. Even though there's people I really miss from other places, my favorite place as far as just a place, geographically and the food, and just the experience of being there, Malaysia, hands down. I even really liked Penang, which was a huge city. Pearl of the Orient, they call it. I wonder what the population of Penang is. Pretty big. But it's another one that just sprawls forever. But the cool thing with Penang is it gets into the mountains. You see a lot of people on bicycles. In Malaysia. I don't think it's safe, <laughs> but you know, they got a lot of mountains for people and they love that. Obviously the same in Thailand. These peanuts, man, they're just perfect. I don't know what's up with the leopard looking stuff inside though. I don't remember always seeing that in peanuts. Maybe it's always that way and I just don't remember. It's entirely possible. This one looks clean. Oh yeah. The cat was, uh, gosh. Well, there's a, so the deal with cats is that in Malaysia, they don't have dogs really because Muslims don't like dogs. Uh, I think the Quran says that they're dirty animals or something. Um, I would assume it's the Quran because it's a religious belief. It's something to do with like, you know, the way Jewish people have an aversion to eating pork, uh, it's kind of like that, except obviously not about eating the dogs. It's just about having them as pets, and you're not supposed to do it. So you just don't see uh, dogs in Malaysia. Um, so I'm sure there was somewhere I went with cats. I don't remember any specific cat. The only specific cat I remember from Malaysia is this cat that I saw. <laughs> There's a few cats in Thailand. I did a video at the Cat Cafe, which was run by this Japanese guy who had all these exotic kinds of cats that you can see in that video. They had everything from cats that look like a panther or a leopard to all kinds of different cats. Um, And you see quite a few cats in Thailand, but they're all, uh, they really take care in Thailand about neutering pets. And I remember in Malaysia seeing a cat 
that wasn't neutered a male cat. And I don't know if it's the first time I saw testicles on a cat, <laughs> but uh, it felt like it. I was like, what the hell? I thought there was something wrong with the cat. I thought it had some growth. And then I realized what I was looking at and I was like, holy shit, this cat is endowed. And uh, I remember that seeing that cat, but as far as any other cat in Malaysia, I don't remember anything specific. So the cats are around, they rule the place. So you'll see them there. Now, as far as dogs in Malaysia, I did a show in a video what the dogs look like there. You remember the scrawny little dog on the Simpsons? That's the way dogs are if you ever do see them in Malaysia. There was this family of dogs that lived over where I like to walk. And I don't know if it was a family or a troop or like, a, not a troop, but like a pack. Like they all hung out together, but I would see a few different ones at the same place and they all looked kind of the same. And those were the only dogs. There might be a one-off dog once in a while I saw around in Malaysia, but it was always like the same kind of looking dog, just a brown dog, kind of small, real skinny, like a, not to the point of being like a greyhound, but it just looked like the dog on the Simpsons. And you'll see him in some of the videos from there, but really not many dogs. Now the dogs that you're probably referring, or the cats you're probably referring to are from India actually, when I was in Goa. When I was in Goa, that's where I showed the cats eating the fish bones. And you would see just this little normal looking cat eat the bones from this huge kingfish. Kingfish, I think it's called, was like a fish, the sought after fish in Goa. It was a little pricey, but it was so good, man. Oh my God. So you see this cat eating a fish skeleton that's almost as big as he is. <laughs> I definitely remember showing that in the video. There were a couple cats who hung around there. But uh, India, you'll see both. Really Thailand's more about the dogs, but you'll see some cats. It's just that there's so many dogs around, the cats are kind of in the shadows, you know what I'm saying? They're just not out walking around everywhere. I haven't had a bad peanut yet. These guys don't mess around. Oh man, my friend got some uh, chocolate covered walnuts. I tried one of those things, man. That was amazing. They must have double dipped it because you had like the same volume of that you have of walnut you had of chocolate surrounding it. It was like half, half nut, half chocolate. Oh wow, Penang was only a quarter of a million. Penang must be smaller than I thought area-wise. I think there's probably just some surrounding towns that I'm thinking are part of it. Because when I went to ride the bus one time there, they have a free bus that goes around Penang. And uh, the free bus mainly goes around just more of the central area. Like Georgetown is this historic part of Penang. And then it maybe went around a couple other little areas like that, but they have like a Chinatown kind of part of Penang. There's a big, uh, a definitely a big Chinese presence there. Where they have like some of the most amazing looking Chinese restaurants that I have not tried, but I want to, that have like those buns that they make, that have like all these different Chinese specialties. There's, you know, different places specialized in different foods. Um, and I'm sure they've got dim sum, which would be awesome to check out. Uh, but then there's another part that's more uh, Middle Eastern type foods. Um, and of course, there's a big Indian, there's a huge Indian presence in Malaysia. So you've got a bunch of Indian places, but then you've also got a bunch of like Lebanese or 
more Persian type places. Um, and that's a whole other, I tried one place like that. I showed you guys the buffet, what I got from the buffet there. And there was some interesting stuff. I wasn't over the moon about all of it. <laughs> There's a, you'll see a video from that time that shows that food. Um, but I got seriously lost one time, way out there in Malaysia from Penang. I was trying to walk somewhere. I don't remember what happened exactly, but I wound up very far away from where I was staying and had to take a couple different buses and really didn't know. Uh, that sounds more like it. <laughs> 1.7. I think you mean 1.78 million. The way that's written in the US, that comma would make us think that you're saying there's 1.7 billion. Of course, in in other countries, they use commas periods to where that would be 1.78 million, but I think that's what you mean is just under 2 million. Um, but yeah, I got lost and I took the bus and took the wrong bus and got really far away from where I was supposed to be. Finally kind of found my way back. So riding on those buses, I was like way out in the mountain, little mountain town kind of really getting into the industrial part. The part I got into of Penang was kind of like the part I'm at here in Puebla, which is where it's all like mechanic shops and suburbs, which would be a really good part of town to be in because you're out of the stinky pollution part of it and you're away from the tourists. And Georgetown was just a dump, man. Not my scene at all. It's cool to walk around and look at the murals because they got some cool artwork, but you walk around there at night and it's all just drunks and hookers and uh, not my scene, man. You remember a minute ago when I was cutting jalapenos and I told you guys I shouldn't touch my eyes or other parts of myself? I just touched my eye. That doesn't feel good, man. And I'm afraid if I put eye drops in, it's gonna make it worse. <laughs> I think I've gotta tough it out this time. I did that the other day and put in eye drops and all it did was wash the jalapeno juice throughout my whole eye. I ain't putting any kind of dent in this bag of peanuts, man. They're really good though. Here's a triple. Soul boat. <laughs> in Baltimore, I'm sure they have good soul food in Baltimore. Yeah, I just had some shrimp today, man. So I went to this, oh my God. It's not, I guess it'd be worth showing you guys. There's nothing exotic about this. It's like the most simple thing in the world. But what I find when I go to eat at places is the hardest things to make, at least in my, at least the hardest things for me to find. It's easy to find some exotic thing that has a bunch of ingredients that's just kind of sets your whole, um, all your taste buds dancing from all kinds of seasoning and the spices and all kinds of stuff. I'm not saying it's super easy to do that, but I think it's a lot easier to do that than what I'm about to describe. The thing I find most rare is when someone can cook the simplest thing and make it exceptional. That to me is magic. 
like when you get the most ordinary, typical food, but it's just done right, man. It's done as good as you can do it. And I had shrimp tacos today. All it is, you get two tortillas, <laughs> two tortillas stacked with a few pieces of fried shrimp. And that's it. But they got all kinds of condiments. The condiments are the cool part. And the shrimp is, I mean, it's perfect. It's so good, man. They have fried fish too. You can either get fried fish or fried shrimp tacos. I've had both. I like the shrimp better. I think it's a better texture for tacos. I think if I was just kind of eat them on a plate with some vegetables or something, I would like the fried fish better. But for tacos, I think the shrimp is more taco appropriate. Um, the fish is just a little wet because it's bigger pieces. And the wetness wouldn't be an issue if you were just eating it off a plate, like a piece of fried catfish. It's perfect like that. That's exactly what it would be like. But on a taco, it's just a little wet for a taco, in my opinion. Um, but as far as the condiments they have, so while you're waiting for your food or with your food, you can get, they have these real tiny chips that I think they'd probably make there in house. Really tiny tortilla chips. So you get these little tortilla chips and you put like, they have green salsa, red salsa, pico de gallo. They have this, uh, these pineapples. It's just like finely minced pineapple. I think he actually cooks it. It's really sweet. It's not hot, but I think it is cooked. Pineapple and pineapple juice, like a pineapple sauce that you can put on your tacos too. And then he has this really sweet corn. I think they call it lote the way it is. Uh, or maybe a lote means ear of corn. But it's off the cob, obviously, and it's like this really sweet stuff you can put on your taco. And then there's some other... I don't know if it's just juice of pineapple, but there's some other real sweet one. So there's like three sweet ones, one pineapple, one corn, and one something else. And then he's got the most amazing thing that I really love, man. It's like this, uh, so a thing that's really popular here that I've, I think I tried it as an accompaniment to something or it was inside something else I ate. I haven't had it just by itself, but Rajas. Rajas means strips, and a very popular food here, they cut the pepper into strips and they put it in crema. Crema is basically just like, uh, it's essentially kind of like sour cream, but uh, I don't know, there may be some difference. It's not quite that sour, but it's not, it's definitely not like a yogurt. It's similar in texture, but it's... Uh, there's rajas and crema, and they, I want to try that. Into, they sell tamales with that, which is what I really want to try. But he has these uh, mushrooms in crema, but the mushrooms are so fine, it's like uh, they're very small. I mean, they're so small that it's like, it's almost like uh, just a... If you take a grain of rice and chop it into like six or eight pieces, that's how big these mushrooms are. They're super small and they're like, maybe not quite that small, but probably four to a grain of rice. Very finely minced. And I think they're probably cooked as well, mushrooms in like a crema. So it's like a, it's like a dip that's just mushrooms and cream. Oh my God, man. It's mostly mushrooms with just a little bit of that crema stuff. It's so amazing. That's my most favorite thing he has there. <laughs> so you can put some of that on your taco. He's also got, in addition to the condiments I just described, he's also got, uh, what you'll see a lot here is just, it's maybe slightly, very, very, very slightly pickled, but hardly. It's, I don't think it's quite raw, but it's maybe just a tiny bit pickled. What we would call banana peppers in the U.S., they cut those like almost hair thin, just very, very thin. 
and they cut some onions just as thin. So you've got these really thin, like finely, finely, not into tiny dices, but like into, into shreds of onion and banana pepper. They always serve that with tacos at most places here. And another thing they have on the side is this amazing uh, carrot salad with, uh, what's in it, it's carrots and probably onions, some other stuff, but it's a little sweet because of the carrots. And that's a raw one, it's not cooked, but it's just in real fine strips. You can put some of that on your tacos too, that's really good. It's all about the condiments, but just the shrimp tacos themselves are so good, man. That was always my, you know, with Indian food, you can get into so many things that are so just extravagant, especially with some of the crazy street food things they make there. They're just over the top. But for me, the real test of how good an Indian restaurant is, is just dal. It's the most simple thing. It's just lentils with probably five or six different spices just cooked and cooked and cooked until it's just, uh, you know, like cream. <laughs> and uh, if it has, if a place has good doll, you can pretty much count on, if they're taking care of something that simple to make it really good, you can basically expect that everything else is gonna be really good. Another popular food here in uh, Puebla is semitas. That's another one I should show you guys. It's a sandwich. That's on like a, uh, it's a sandwich on a round roll that's basically like a, uh, Hamburger bun with sesame seeds. <clears throat> and they're just a little bit toasty. The sandwich is served cold. Um, and there's different ones you can get. I've tried melan melanesa with queso. That was excellent. Um, so the melanesa was very similar to the sandwich I showed you in Mexico City, the torta. They bred the melanesa, which I'm not, it was good, but you can easily get tired of that stuff prepared in that way, in my opinion, because basically what they're doing is kind of cheaping out on giving you a bunch of meat. They're taking a very thin piece of meat and breading it. And like with that sandwich I showed you in Mexico City that had that pile it was the most ridiculous sandwich you've ever seen. It's like as big as my head. But they piled the meat on, but it was all breaded meat. So you're getting like at least as much meat, at least the amount of meat you're getting, you're getting a breading as well. So it's like almost half breading or half breading. And it's a pile of it. So you can imagine <laughs> eating a sandwich like that, that you can get overwhelmed with the breading. And especially if you're like staying a while, staying in a place a while and you're trying multiple sandwiches and you feel like every sandwich you're ordering, you keep getting just a bunch of breading. That's a sandwich. <laughs> so the sandwich is already on bread. You know, you got a bunch of breaded meat and it's like, just not super appealing for me. But that said, it wasn't so much overkill on the samita because it wasn't a big pile of breaded meat. It was just a normal kind of smallish amount of breaded meat. And then you had the queso cheese, like I was telling you about that really, really, bou really bouncy like mozzarella style cheese. You have a bunch of that and then they put some avocado, some salsa, onions, tomatoes, usual suspects, maybe some carrot. Um, 
delicious sandwich, but uh, probably a more popular, uh, well, you can get it with pata too, pata. I'm not a huge fan of pata. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, another thing that's probably the most common thing you'll get on a samita is uh, cabeza de porco, porco. You also see him say pulque, which I think is pulled pork, I think is another option, but maybe that's just a torta. Um, usually it's cabeza on the samita. And I was asking my friend here, I didn't really know what cabeza, well, I saw cabeza at first, I know it means head. So I was like thinking about it and I was, you know, the meat's awful thick to be just scalp. I was asking him like, it must be scalp and cheek too, right? They just used all the skin from the whole head. And he said, well, it's the brains too. So I ate brains without even knowing it. And I've been going back and getting them again. I really like it. But there's all kinds, it's like a medley, man. You've got all kinds of little bits of meat in there. So I'm sure there's brains. And then there's also cheek and scalp. Uh, I don't think they put the tongue in there though. And that's something I do want to try is lengua tacos. The tongue tacos is supposed to be super, super tender. Um, but those, uh, probably the most popular style of samita you see the most is the cabeza. And you'll see, man, <laughs> walking around a meat market or walking around a market in general in Mexico, you'll see some interesting things. I mean, they just take, cut a whole piece of an animal and put it right there at the front of their shop for you to see how quality their meat is, man. And you'll see a head. You know, uh, I saw a pig head cut right down the middle, man. They put this pig head up real high so that people can see that's what they're selling. Imagine a whole pig head cut right down the middle and they got the side with the skull and everything else facing out and they put that up real high above their store. So uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll cut up about any damn part of the animal, I guess, that you want. Now the pata, I did try pata. I had on a tostada. What they told me, what my friend told me pata was, wasn't quite what I was expecting. So, <laughs> I had chicken feet. Now, I don't know if I showed you guys a video of that. I thought I did. But while I was at that place in Goa, I saw, man, I'm losing people talking about the animal parts. While I was in Goa, I saw this guy come in. I was staying at this guest house. The one I told you was like animal house. I see this guy come in with this big bag and it looks like the, yeah, it is. You're absolutely right. But it's not the, it's not the part of the foot I thought it was. So I saw this guy and go, he comes in with this big bag and it's like all these, I don't know what it was. I thought it was like some kind of root because there were all these funny spiky things sticking out every which way. And he was so excited, man. He had, it was just this biggest beaming smile on his face. He said, I got something to cook for you, man. He was so excited. And uh, I'm just like sitting there, not sure what to expect. <laughs> he brings out these, he brings out a plate and all that's on it is like three chicken feet with hot sauce on it. And, and I mean, a chicken foot, like seriously, all it was was a foot. <laughs> a whole foot and uh, I did, was like I didn't know quite I just started chewing on it and I uh, wasn't sure quite what to do and uh, so I just took a bite and it was super tender man uh, the most tender buttery cut of meat I've ever had it was actually quite delicious to be honest and the bones were just like little pellets uh, I mean, it's basically like just, uh, 
you know, in your finger. You got just these separate little pieces of bone. That's all it is, except it's really tiny because it's a chicken foot. So you're just spitting out these little pebbles of bone for each of the joints. And that was, I didn't ask for more, but if I was there again and he offered it to me, I'd eat it. It was good. It's basically just like hot wings, except even more, ten, way more tender. Um, so when my friend here in Puebla told me it's pig foot, I kind of figured it's going to be like a meaty piece of pig foot with some like rock-like bone pieces inside it. But no, all it is, all pata is, is the cartilage itself. So all you're eating is the rock-type bone pieces, but they're not rock-like. Basically what you're getting is like, uh, it's like the size of this. It's this big, and it's these white pieces, and they're almost, they're not round like this, they're cube-like. So it's basically just like a square cube, like of sugar, except it's really smooth and it's kind of pretty soft, but not uh, not like soft in a buttery sort of way. Soft and like a, uh, you really can't describe it. It's like no other texture I've ever eaten. So if you're someone who gets really grossed out by weird textures, this would not, I highly do not recommend that you eat pata. <laughs> and I'm not gonna get it again, personally, man. I I ate it to be polite, but I did not enjoy it. <laughs> it was like, uh, I seriously don't know what, the closest thing I guess I could compare the texture to, there's another video I made for you guys, when I was in Thailand and I went and basically, it was the girlfriend I had at the time showing you guys different Asian desserts. And they had these tapioca, basically the tapioca balls and bubble tea, that's what it's like. That's a shorter way of saying it because these desserts were very much like that, like tapioca squishy type desserts. It's pretty close to the tapioca balls except it's a cube and it's cartilage from the pig foot. And it's not, there's no flavor really to it. I don't know, I wasn't a big fan, but that's a popular thing here. Yeah, like, I remember this chick I went out with in high school. <laughs> she was half German, half something else, and uh, her mom had pig feet on top of the refrigerator in a jar. I never tried one. But I definitely remember seeing pickled pig's feet in jars growing up. It seemed like there's some meat but I guess not much, huh? <laughs> really popular here, of course, in Mexico City too, but I think, I don't know, man, maybe even more in Puebla is the uh, Middle Eastern style, like tacos al pastor. You'll see them everywhere in Mexico City too, and even in Baya de Bravo, but I don't know that I remembered seeing them so much in Guadalajara. Maybe I did and I just don't remember. But there are a lot of, a lot of, uh, Talk about a lot of pastor here in Puebla. And usually what I'll do, I just buy the meat by the kilo and get just the meat. They'll give it to you with all kinds of stuff. If you get what they call paquete, packet or package. 
Um, but I just like the meat. I like to have it with rice or salads. Um, but what I really want to try that I haven't yet is they make what they call like Arebe style tortillas. Of course, you've got your normal corn tortillas, flour tortillas here. Corn is much more prevalent, but uh, the Arebe style, it's much more thick and it's with flour, it's basically like naan, is what it is. Um, I wanna try those. But there's so many variations, man, of tacos, it's ridiculous. You've got, you know, what we would call a quesadilla, like you would get in the US, just a tortilla with some stuff and another tortilla, that's actually called a gordita here. So you've got your gorditas, you've got a quesadilla is really just, all it is is a thick tortilla folded in half with stuff in it. That could be called a quesadilla, but it could also be called a quesadilla if it's closed and it's just got stuff inside like a hot pocket. That could also be called a quesadilla. And usually they would make that with cheese and then cut it open and stuff meat or whatever else you want inside it. Um, and then you've got what they call like a picadita, which is all that is, is like, it's maybe a little thicker than a tortilla, but it's like a tostada, but soft. And it's just a little thicker than a normal tortilla. That's a picadita. Then you've got Mamitas, I don't even know what a mamita is. I think it's some similar variation of that. And then you've also got uh, tlacoyas, which are like, <laughs> they're shaped like a football. They're kind of pointy on the ends, like a football. And they're sealed up like a quesadilla would be. I don't know what the hell the difference between that and a quesadilla is besides the shape, but they'll usually have beans inside Tlacoyas, T-L-O-C-O-Y-A or something like that. Um, they'll usually have beans and cheese and then they'll add other stuff in there if you want. I haven't tried one of those yet. And then there's even like three or four more that I don't even remember on the list. You'll see these signs with just, they'll say like tacos, tortas, uh, Samitas, which I already told you about, quesadillas, mamitas, tlacoyas, picaditas, <laughs> and then we'll go have like a couple or a few more. And it's like they're all like real similar variations of the same thing. That's kind of what uh, what Omar was kind of making a joke about in that one video I made. Um, and then, of course, tacos dorado, which are really just what we would call flautas in the U.S., which is just a rolled tortilla with things inside that's crispy. Usually, it'll usually be chicken or cheese, but sometimes I've seen them with mashed potatoes inside them. And that's just uh, tacos dorados con papas. Usually papas... If you see papas, look at these, man. What a fine specimen. Usually if you see papas, it's potato chips. That's what papas is in Spanish. Now, if you see <laughs> tortilla chips, those are totopos. French fries are papas, papas francesa, or francais. Francais, you'll see francesa and also francais, it depends. Uh, and it'll just say papas though, if you see that kind of taco dorado papas, it's like mashed potatoes inside the flauta, those were Man, those were amazing. <laughs> I really liked that.
Yeah, it's basically like an empanada. Yeah, Tinga, I've heard of that too. There's so many different regional things, man. I do remember reading about Tinga though. I don't know, can you even tell a difference? Maybe. Yeah, I got nothing else to do tonight, guys. We only got four people in here. They've been putting some amazing pool matches on AccuStats. I highly recommend AccuStats. Pat Fleming has a hell of an organization there. And the cool thing is you can chat with Pat himself in the live streams. It's kind of cool. So the live stream is not really a live stream, though. That's the caveat. He's broadcasting matches from, gosh, they could be from four years ago. They got such a, they've got like three different events they do. And then the, within each event, they have different uh, eight ball, nine ball, one pocket, bank pool, straight pool. So they'll have just like, they'll have so many matches from each event. And he's slowly releasing them on YouTube. So what he'll do, he like makes a live broadcast of a event that's already taken place. But unless you were there, or unless you talked to someone who was, or unless you bought the DVD from AccuStats, which is also available, then you don't know who won. So it's cool because it's like there's still suspense <laughs> and the matches are so good because these players are like the best ones in the world. So I've really been enjoying those. You watch them live and it's like you're watching a live event and you're chatting with everybody, but there's nothing happening tonight. <laughs> there was one last night. Yeah, that's my favorite way to cook about anything. When I was uh, getting raw meat, staying in the mountains there before I came to Mexico, I'd get chicken thighs or chicken breast and slow cook them in my Instant Pot. Oh my God. Even the breast comes out so tender doing it that way. It's really the best. These guys, uh, they really know how to make some chicken here, man. Pork is king. I don't like to, can you imagine Will Burson doesn't like to waste peanuts? Those are the first two I dropped in the trash. I keep this <laughs> down at my feet here. But uh, that's one of my very favorite things to eat here is the pollo adobada that they cook on the grill. And then you also see a lot of rotisserie places. So good, man. And so cheap. Yeah, I've been getting, uh, I was trying to find an airline ticket today I wanted to see what kind of COVID test I need to fly into the U.S. And I was trying to think of all kinds of schemes to not have to do that. 
<laughs> really kind of bugs me. It ain't just the money. I mean, I don't know, man. I think if I walk across the border into El Paso or San Diego or some other point, I don't have to get a test. But it's just makes it so complicated. <laughs> it's easier to just get the test. The other thing I've been kind of wondering if, if I can do is take a bus into Guatemala. I think maybe if I enter Guatemala by land, I don't have to do that. Don't have to have a test. I've got to explore this option some more. It may be the most easy way to avoid it. It's absolutely the principle of it. That's all it is. I know I haven't been sick and I just don't want to, I don't know, man. This feels a little bit like uh, I keep waking up in this, uh, I don't know, man, this strange reality. Amazing peanuts. Really about anywhere you go here. When I ride the bus around. Now on the main city bus. They probably do still require <clears throat> a face mask. But on like the little more local bus, they're basically like taxi cabs. They're privately operated. Those buses, the drivers don't wear them in general. There's always people on the bus that don't have the mask. They don't say anything to you. They don't look at you funny, nothing. If you don't wear it, nobody cares. So I don't even wear them on there anymore. Uh, the only place here is if you go inside a shopping mall or inside a grocery store, you still have to put it on and take your temperature on the thing. But I hear even in Northern California now in the US that even in like Bay Area grocery stores, people for the most part are not wearing masks and it's not required. So I wonder how long till that catches on in Mexico. I have no idea what to expect as far as the time frame. I'm not that concerned. I'm only in the grocery store for like five minutes, seven minutes. I'm just curious. What I'm more curious about though, is if travel is gonna get back to any kind of normal anytime soon. Because Costa Rica Costa Rica doesn't require a test or vaccine or quarantine, but they do require you to have health insurance that covers COVID. So I don't know, man. It's kind of a drag in all honesty. I'm just... Probably gotta keep exploring Mexico. I have to bite the bullet and take the test probably to go somewhere and reset. Seems like we're kind of fading out on here, guys. Nice chatting with you, Soul Deep. And not sure who else is still in here. I think Leisure left. Trout Junkie. Chris 580. Ethan. 
Nice hanging out with all you guys. If you have any last questions or topic requests, speak now or forever hold your peace. No mask for you. That's what I'm hearing from pretty much everywhere. That's what I'm hearing from pretty much everywhere. What you just said there. Which makes it more attractive for me to spend time in the U.S., but the problem is so damn expensive. <laughs> Very expensive, man. And I don't know what for. Like, what do I get in the U.S. that I don't have here? To live in a city where I don't have to have a car is just insane. And I don't have a car now. I sold my van. So, how am I even going to get around? I kind of need a car in most places in the U.S. Public transportation. Public transportation is really bad in most places. The places where it's good are just ridiculously expensive in my experience. So I don't know, man. I don't know what I would really get that uh, would make it worth it, so. Probably keep on keeping on down here in Mexico, guys. Thanks for hanging out tonight. <laughs>